Hey, everybody. So glad you are joining us for this month. March's Conversations for the Future, our liftoff podcast. So many exciting things happened in February, and we're glad you're here for us during March because there's a lot of exciting things coming up, including, I don't know if I need a drum roll, but I wish I had like the button you could push for the, the drum roll, please. But we are going to be talking about the solar eclipse. So many cities across the country are in the path of totality. Daniel, I didn't see the last one. I'm going to actually get to see this one. Are you going to be in a spot where you'll be able to see um, the total solar eclipse? Remind me again of the date. <laughs> it is Monday, April 8th, which is, it, it's so close, you know, very, very close. Unfortunately, that's right after like an extended spring break for myself and family. So we'll be close to there, uh, really teasingly close to, um, to that. But uh, unfortunately, we'll likely not be able to make it that's okay i mean i'm sure somebody's gonna have a live stream right so you can go to nasa they'll be having a live stream there's gonna be so many events all across the country i'm sure the news is just gonna be blowing up yeah and we will be further south so it's really it's really tempting to try to get those clear skies generally in the south it'd be interesting to see like a, a cloud cover prediction map for for typically the beginning of april there um because the actually there is one i should um i should share that with the group and um, we can edit that in or something like that, but there's an actual one. I looked at the forecast right now, and unfortunately for parts of the Northeast, it does look like typically during this time of year, we do have more clouds where if you're going to be viewing in some of the Southern cities, like down toward Dallas and whatnot, it looks a little bit better. I'm actually going to be in Dallas hosting an event uh, for the eclipse. So I'm excited because that's the beginning of the path of totality as it makes its way up. So it'll be, it'll just be interesting to see how people react to this. And, and remind me again, the length of time there. I mean, if you get clouds for, I mean, it's a relatively short window, 15, 20 minutes. It's so short. Well, it starts to go to totality and it's actually in the actual totality where it's supposed to go dark for, I, 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 I've seen it, but I haven't experienced it personally, but it'll go dark for like a couple of minutes and then you'll slowly start to see that shadow and, and everything move. And it's, I mean, you obviously need to wear your special protective glasses, which you can buy online. I believe NASA has them. Some of the science centers have them, but yeah, for that moment, that couple of seconds, I've actually heard like animals react differently. And um, it's supposed to be like the most incredible experience. Yeah, Ohio looks like it's the closest for us. So I, I was tempted to try to shoot out to uh, Ohio, but then as you get more northern there, you can typically, I think, get more cloud cover. So I'll be checking the map and, and if it works. What what day of the week is it again? April. So it's 8th a Monday. Before. April eighth is, is a Monday. Monday, and it's going to be as we go into late morning, early afternoon, depending on your time zone. So it's uh, exciting. My hometown's Cleveland. That's one of the there's but there's fun events there, Daniel. So you can go to my hometown if you are looking for a place, but. We're just really excited to have this episode and talk to some experts ahead of the eclipse. So that way you'll have some background information. You're going to be learning about a lot of cool things. So this is a this is a fun episode for today. And I imagine maybe is Johnson and Glenn both going to be kind of in the path of partial totality? Um, I don't think Houston. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think they're close. I'd have to you pull that map up and look at and pinpoint where they're at. But definitely they're close enough. And if not, I'm sure they're going to be there's going to be a huge event in Dallas. I know that's going to include NASA. That's one of the events that I'm at that's going to have people from NASA there. So, you know, the best thing I would suggest is if you're not in the actual path path, just go online and look up Path of Totality Events 2024. I've seen a lot of people do that and all the local stations, newspapers are putting out the different local events. So you can go to an event or just find somebody in their backyard and say, hey, I'll cook some burgers if you'll let me watch the eclipse. <laughs> yeah, and, and kind of coupling it in with other activities, you know, okay, we got the family all loaded up, we're, we're taking off from school and work and, and going to drive out, you know, do we visit a NASA center, you know, what, you know, make it part of something just in case there is that cloud cover, you know, kind of like going to a right. launch, you go to a launch, you get a certain scrub percentage and stuff, you know, you visit Kennedy space center at the same time or something. Um, so yeah, hopefully, uh, it's, 
always tough, um, you know, with the with the school calendar and, um, you know, weather. Right between the school calendar and weather, it's it's a tough thing to work around. But well, everyone's gonna blame me, but the weather does no matter what. <laughs> But, you know, I'm really hoping things will clear up and everybody will be seeing it. You know, I actually just did an article for space.com. Delta is offering two flights. One of them's officially sold out. I'm sure the other one, if not already, will be. But they're actually having a flight that's going to come along the path of totality. So you can fly. And I would assume it's maybe one side of the plane instead of both because you wouldn't want people climbing over you trying to see it. But yeah um really cool article real cool information to think and airlines like okay how can we get involved i think so many people are just trying to find ways to get involved in the eclipse because it's cool it combines science and space and just kids are like loving this kind of situation interesting is this the first time they've done a flight like that a totality flight I think so, because I covered the eclipse, uh, the last total solar eclipse when I was in Weather Nation in Denver, and I didn't see anything like that. So I think the CEO and they all came together and actually worked with their staff meteorologists to put together the best plan to say, OK, here's a flight. And you could be literally riding along the path to high. I don't know how it's going to work out because I think there's got to be different angles and looking and whatnot. But I can just imagine how cool would it be to be that high up with 30,000 feet and 50 messaging. Hey, guess what? I'm on the path of totality right now. It's better than driving. <laughs> I'd almost, you might even get like kind of the overview effect from that experience too, especially Ooh. if you had a window, say, you know, I don't know if they were able to tilt or whatnot, right? But if you had kind of a, kind of a skylight on, a, on an airplane, which I don't think they often have, you'd basically, right, see... You know, you'd see stars in space, right? I, I think oh my God. Um, I if you're that it. high up, if you're that high up, it would basically be, you know, like some of these high altitude um, air flights because everything else would be lit up kind of around you and below you. But then that, that view up would probably be dark sky. So that's an interesting uh, one. I think that's, I think it's going to be fascinating no matter what. And I think, I'm um, sorry, I was uh, looking at our messages. People are already joining the conversation, which is great. I think it's going to be an interesting thing, but I feel like if it's a company like Delta, they've probably done a lot of the research because that was people were responding to my article. Well, what do they got to do? There's got to be a tilt and stuff. But I'm sure if they're advertising this, they don't want it to not be a great experience. So I just, I really would love to be a part of it, but it'll be interesting. If anyone watching has booked their flight, you should let us know because it just sounds like such a cool experience. Well, we are going to get things started. We have a few of our guests joining a little bit later, but we are going to kick things off. Now, Daniel, I know we have our little segments. We can let you kick your segment off and uh, just kind of get things going. Sure. So um, my segment, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about water today because okay. I had a, a humidifier um, right. overflow on me. And I thought, hey, this, is, this would not be a space problem, actually, most likely. And when you have a closed loop system and you, you have condensation, right? You have a sealed um, system. If you're, if you're out in space, living in space, um, you know, regardless whether you're in microgravity or you have gravity or Mars gravity, um, the water cycle is going to be really important. So this kind of made me think, okay, you know, well, as much as this is an earth problem, you know, our wooden floors aren't made for water, you know, our space habitats will likely be built around this constraint. And the interesting thing is with um, plants in space in particular, is that when they transpire water, they can actually water themselves in a closed system, right? Is when you're condensating that water and feeding it back into it, the, the total system water may need to be increased. You could actually have a system basically water itself um, for, for a greenhouse in space, which is kind of like, oh, you don't have to remember to water, you know, the house plant or the garden, you know, to a certain extent. It may it may volumetrically have to um, get more water to it, but uh, just an interesting kind of thing to think about in space. How some things will be easier, um, some things that we, oh no, I forgot to water that plant on the windowsill, you know, for months and months. Um, you could have systems where you're actually collecting that condensate and watering um, your plants with it. So. That's fascinating. I mean, it's just simple things that we don't think about every day, but I mean, that's why you're one of the experts. Yeah, I mean, closed closed loop systems um, have, you know, there aren't many, right? We don't operate many on Earth. So um, where, where this idea came from was actually Biosphere 2 is they're rebooting their test module where they have this capacity. They have a very standard 
um, heat pump with a condensation unit and are collecting the water right off of there. And I thought, oh, well, we could tie that directly into the irrigation um, system for these plants within here. So that's where that kind of, oh, wow, you know, almost no greenhouses. You're really worried about closing the water cycle. You know, you, you vent it, you try to get rid of the humidity or you, you know, it's easier to do that, but in a closed loop system you do. So um, yeah, interesting, uh, it, you know, problems on earth versus problems in space. Well, I like how we can bring two and two together. So that's interesting. Thanks so much, Daniel. We are going to move along next. Uh, I, I just want to check, is there anything else that you wanted to add? If, if anyone has any questions on that, they just leave them in the chat for you? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, we'll head right next into my Rocket Girl report. And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, my background, I'm sure by now you are because, you know, this is how I roll, but I am a meteorologist and space and science correspondent. So the Rocket Girl Report is something I'll be doing every month. I'll have guests on the show. I'll be highlighting uh, big topics during the month that we're recording. So for this month, the Rocket Girl Report is going to talk about Women's History Month because there have been so many trailblazers in space. And the women that have made their contributions of all different cultures and backgrounds Fantastic. So for my little quick segment today and in future segments, I'm actually going to be having some pretty awesome guests on, but I want to talk about, we have four minutes. So I'm going to talk about four groups of trailblazing women. Sorry, obviously I need a little more coffee this morning. So we'll start off with, I think something everybody can think about when we talk women's history month is hidden figures. We talk about the women that were behind just really making a difference. For example, American astronaut John Glenn getting him into orbit back in 1962. These were the women that worked at Langley. They were some of the first African-American women with college degrees that were hired by the program. And they were called the West Area Computers where they worked. And literally because of the work that they did, they were able to help with the space program and get things literally off the ground. So we'll talk about the hidden figures, the three computers, we had Mary Jackson, we had Katherine Johnson, and we had Dorothy Vaughn. So Mary Jackson, she was from Hampton, Virginia, and she was actually with the All Black West Area Computing Section. She did wind tunnel experiments and flight experiments. So she had to take data from the flight tests. And she was really incredible because she really just, helped break that glass ceiling with the stuff that she was doing. She spent 13 years with NASA and NACA, and she ended up doing so much work behind the scenes. But as we saw in the movie and we hear about in her bio, a lot of that work was so critical for our flight missions moving forward. Then we had Katherine Johnson and she, let's see, I'm just pulling up these bios to get you guys all the latest information. So she was actually... She joined the West Area Computing Section at Langley as well. She was a school teacher though first in 1937 and she started working with data from flight tests. But after the Soviet Union launched Sputnik back in 1957, she started to give some lectures and really had a lot of contributions as well during the Mercury mission. She did trajectory analysis for Shepard's Freedom 7 mission in 1961. John Glenn actually requested her based on her work that she did, which just gives me chills. And she just made such an incredible difference in the program. She worked on the space shuttle and the Earth Resources Satellite and co-authored 26 research reports and retired in 1986 from NASA. And then we had Dorothy Vaughn. Dorothy joined Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory in 1943. And she also started as a math teacher. So it's interesting, these math teachers ended up getting recruited for NASA and became in such a, a inspiring trajectory forward. She got permanently hired during to NASA, but there was laws in place apparently that she and her fellow black colleagues needed to work separately from what they called the white female computers. This is how it was back in the day. All the first supervisors were white, but she became the first black NACA supervisor in 1949. And then she was the one who helped employees receive promotions or pay raises. When segregation ended in 1958, she became an expert programmer in Fortran, continued to contribute to different tests. And then she retired in 1971. So hidden figures, incredible women in history. 
Then we have Sally Ride, first American woman in space. I, I remember learning so much about her in school. She was not just an astronaut, she was a physicist as well as an educator. She was the first American woman to go in space when she flew on the space shuttle Challenger on June 18th in 1983. She made two shuttle flights and later became a champion for science education as a role model. Um, just another incredible woman there. I These stories just, you know, they give you chills. And then we talk about someone like Mae Jameson, for example. And May was actually, when say Space Shuttle Endeavor was on its second mission, she became the first African-American in space. But she's also more than just an astronaut. She is a physician. She was a Peace Corps volunteer, a teacher. And then she also founded and was president of two different technology companies. So really awesome. And then I'll wrap things up because I know I'm, I'm going over my time. But NASA astronaut, Dr. Ellen Ochoa, not only was she a veteran astronaut and the 11th director of Johnson Space Center, she was Johnson Space Center's first Hispanic director and their second female director. And she was the deputy center director and the director of flight crew operations. She started off as a research engineer at Ames and then she moved to Johnson Space Center in the 90s. And she got selected as the astronaut and her mission, she became the first Hispanic woman to go to space, was on the STS-56 mission aboard Discovery in 1993. So I can go into these women's backgrounds, <laughs> and there are so many more than that. But I think just goes to show the diversity and the culture of women that had to overcome adversity to become the, not just the first at what they do, but leading the way for more women going forward. And I find it interesting because I actually had a one-on-one -on -one interview I did with Dr. Sam Proctor who was aboard the Inspiration4 mission and became the first African-American woman to pilot a spacecraft. And I remember I have chills when I, I asked her about, you know, being the first. And she's like, it's it's more than that. You know, it's more than saying, I'm putting it on your resume. I was the first at this. It's doing something not just for society, but for yourself. And that when we come together, when we're passionate about something, when we help each other, we can accomplish whatever we want. And so this month, do your, uh, I, I encourage everybody's homework to do your research and learn something about a woman in the space industry that was a trailblazer and maybe post that story on your social media or maybe learn more about it. And um, I actually have my shirt on, it says leading in, in lead, leading the way. And it's in a women in aviation, some of the first WASP pilots of women, the first flyers for the military in the 1940s during World War II. And uh, I think Women History Month is a good reminder for all women that anything is possible, even if it takes extra work to accomplish it. That's your Rocket Girl Report from me. I love it. Hi, everybody. That Yeah, I you know, it's it's amazing because we talk so much about um, it, it takes everyone to make the space industry it's taken everyone to make the space industry what it is, but you don't hear those stories. Um, and so I think a lot of people, and I've told this story about myself included, you know, like, oh, well, I'm not an engineer. I don't have clearance. So I'm never going to be able to work in the space industry. But it's just not true. And it, it's there's so much opportunity for everybody. And it's just really exciting where things are going as well. Um, and so, yeah, thanks for that, Meredith. That was, it's incredible. I love hearing all those stories. Uh, for All Mankind does a really good job, the, the TV show on Apple TV about it's an al alternate history of the space race, but the first season dives into, you know, historically accurate uh, characters and and with a big focus on the, the women who would become astronauts, right? And um, it's just an incredible story. So thank you for that. Oh, um, another one. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. We're talking that the space race just came out. As we're coming out of Black History Month, in the space race uh, is brand newly released a series, I believe it's by National Geographic, and it really goes into the pioneers from the African American community yeah. when it came to space too. So yeah, two two things to put on your homework there, Rivaldo. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, and I think it's it's a great um, segue into what I want to highlight another company, another startup-ish kind of growth company within the space community, within the space industry, who are doing some incredible things uh, related to my background here, um, de space debris. So the company is called Astroscale, and they are focused on delivering 
uh, life extension, inspection, end of life, and active debris removal services and solutions in all orbits. Um, and what that means is, you know, a, a lot of organizations, you know, they send up so many satellites, you think of Starlink and things like that. Um, and, you know, many times their end of life, for example, like when that satellite just stops working, um, is to just deorbit it, right, and let it burn up in the atmosphere. So, but but sometimes that maybe that's not necessary, or, you know, there, there's certainly technology coming that can take those satellites and recycle them, turn them into something useful again um, in orbit, or maybe we can fix them. And so um, Astroscale, in fact, they uh, are right in the middle of their Address J, that's A-D-R-A-S-J mission, um, which is rendezvous operations, uh, rendezvous and proximity operations for on-orbit servicing. So this is the world's first attempt to safely approach and characterize uh, an existing piece of large debris that's in orbit, because that's a big part of it, right? Like, you, you know, everything's moving so fast. And so in order to do any kind of servicing or to grab a piece of active debris, you first have to assess the situation. The astroscale craft has to, you know, kind of match the speed and spin of the object, you know, and become in sync with it. Um, and what then, you know, and then kind of figure out like, okay, what are we going to do? Are we going to attach to it? Um, and then, you know, are we going to either try to fix it or refuel it? You know, things like that to um, to to help this piece of debris either become something new or, you know, um, or end its life, right? And and take care of it so that we don't continue adding to this. So Astroscale uh, US, Astroscale Japan, it's it's really just an amazing organization. They're part of this incredible uh, community of collaborative space startups who are really working to build this circular sustainable space economy where we are able to clean up space debris and at the same time enable us to be able to work and live in space and beyond. So take a look at Astroscale. Um, you know, I think they have some careers uh, or jobs available. So uh, it's astroscale-us.com here in the US forward slash careers if you want to go straight there. Take a look because it's um, it's just really cool stuff. So now we're going to uh, shift into a really exciting conversation. It's a new segment. Um, I want to bring on Laura Winter. Laura, hello. Hey there. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm good now that I've got the right URL and I have arrived on the show. Yes. Well, we, we're excited to have you. So uh, Laura Winter is the host of the Downlink podcast. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. Uh, we're excited because Laura is... Um, this segment will be more kind of like investigative journalism, right? Like a deep dive into some topics. It's more of a deep dive. I mean, when you yeah. say investigative journalism, that's a very particular genre, right? Okay. Where you're like doing FOIAs and things like that. And, you know, holding, you know, some people uh, who are in charge, you know, responsible for, for stuff. Right. But this, gotcha. this yeah. kind of goes in that direction to be, to, to be, you know, Frank, but I'll let my guests do the talking for that instead. Love it. Love it. Well, I, so yeah. So tell us a, real quick about the downlink podcast and then, and then, yeah, take it away on, on this segment. Uh, we're talking about space based solar power, which is in relation to the eclipse and the sun, obviously. So I turn it over to you, my friend. Okay. Well, my name is Laura Winter, and I am the editor and host of the Downlink podcast, right? So if you have an interest in space, the space business, or defense, you can get it and subscribe to it anywhere you get your podcasts. Um, but now joining us today for a discussion on what is called space-based solar power I really do want to turn it over to my guests because they are the real experts in it. And so I'm hoping that Peter Gerritsen is here on the line. Peter, are you here? I am here, Laura. Fantastic. And Ed? Hello. Where are Can you? you? Hear me? 
I can hear you. I can't see you though. Uh, my he's camera there. should be on. No, he's there. I see him. Yeah. I see him. See him? Yeah. Okay, good. If everybody else <laughs> can, see him, then great. That's that's what counts, right? So, uh, you know, as I said, you know, we're really lucky to have Peter Gerritsen here today. He's a senior fellow, a co-director of the Space Policy Initiative at the American Foreign Policy Council. And he's the co-author of the book, Scramble for the Skies, the Great Power Competition to Control the Resources of Outer Space, of which solar power is one of those kind of things. And he's also the host of the Space Strategy Podcast, which you can also get anywhere you go and listen to podcasts and subscribe to that. We also have Ed Tate. He's the co-founder and chief technology officer of Vertisolis. It's a U.S. space-based solar power company that is working to capture the power of the sun in space and beam watts to the ground. And so, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on Liftoff. Hi, glad thank to be you, here. Laura. It's great to be here. All right, I'm going to try something kind of fun and funky. I'm going to try and share an image so that we can kind of clue in people to, you know, what we're talking about as we're talking about it, because it is kind of an ecosystem, right? So let's see how this goes. I'm going to try and share this. All right. Yep, it's an ESA slide, but that's because the European Space Agency is really moving out on this. Uh, but... Peter, you know, I've asked you to come on to lift off because I don't think anyone would mistake you for being a tree hugger, right? So when and why did you first get interested in space-based solar power? What is it? And why is it something that you passionately advocate for? And I'd add, you've done this in the face of quite a few obstacles. Peter, give us, give us a quick brief overview. Well, I came to space solar power quite a while ago, uh, circa uh, 20 years ago, actually in 2004. And I was the chief of future technology for headquarters Air Force. And we were being asked to think beyond traditional threats, to look at uh, catastrophic threats, to look at uh, the potential for climate change. And of course, there was the concern about great power competition and uh, played a war game um, where uh, the the reason for kind of a big sort of World War III war was a, uh, a shortage of fossil fuel resources. I didn't like that. Uh, I thought that was sort of a terrible future. So I wondered whether or not there was a way to innovate out of that and not have that pressure. And after chasing down almost every potential energy system, uh, I arrived at this idea of space solar power um, that had already been out there um, for well over uh, probably 50 years before that. And um, so what you're seeing here is a satellite that is in a, a high Earth orbit. And the satellite uh, receives the sun. It may or may not have reflectors depending on its, um, on its design. This specific design has reflectors at the top. And then it beams it onto solar panels, just like you'd have on your roof. Um, and then it, it, it turns around and immediately converts that into radio waves. And because the aperture, because the, the size of that transmitter is so large, it can beam it essentially like a flashlight beam down to the ground. And what you see at the end there is what's called a rectenna, where you're receiving power. Um, and we're talking about city scale power, you know, power that could, you know, be enough for an entire city basically 24 hours a day. And so what's exciting to me about this particular uh, technology is that once we realize it, it will scale to all global demand about six or seven times over and enable us to transition to a truly 24 hour fully green society without all the difficulties that current um, renewables like solar and wind have where they have to have tremendously long transmission lines that are very costly uh, and require sort of imminent domain in over people's property and you don't have to overbuild on storage so this is the biggest idea in space and energy and one that could truly solve global climate change 
So let's take a look at a uh, another image in just a second. You know, this episode uh, of Liftoff is about the sun and the solar eclipse, right? So when there is a solar eclipse, we can expect that those ground-based photovoltaics or solar power cells um, aren't really gonna produce much energy, right? Because it's gonna be like nighttime. So Ed, what are the conditions under which space-based solar power will actually work? Well, well, just as you started, you need to have sunlight shining on the satellite. Uh, one of the things that we get is because of the orbits we choose, the sun or the shadow from the earth, the shadow from the moon very rarely is going to ever cross over the satellite. So they're going to be in sunlight almost continuously and able to be in power. Now, as we scale, and so when we're in shadow, you are actually going to have the satellite not be able to be in power, but we're, we're not really looking at a single solar power satellite. We're looking at many solar power satellites. And when those solar power satellites work together, if one gets shadowed, the other one can take up the load. And this is the same as with conventional power plants. Conventional power plants go offline for service. Space-based solar power plants will go offline where they'll have reduced output because they're in the shadow of the earth, the shadow of the moon. Um, but other ones will be able to shift their beams, dispatch the power and keep things running. And doesn't this also help the grid? Because oh. is there like when 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 we if we're doing wind power or we're doing solar power, you know, when those sort of energy sources aren't well there, like at night or there just isn't any wind, there is an issue with the grid, which I think space based solar power should be able to kind of help out with. Yeah, so there's three basic things you're you're, you're dealing with. Um, one is when you get power to your house, you're actually paying for the power generation, the fuel used. You're paying for the distribution, the transmission, and then the cost of the power plants that run everything. And surprisingly, even if your fuel wasn't there at all, you'd still end up paying about 75% or more of your bill simply to pay for all the other infrastructure. The intermittent renewables have the problem that they produce power when the power is available, when it's a bright sunny day, when the wind's blowing, um, any of the other sources that come in like that are just, they're intermittent and they have to be blended, first of all, and that's why people are talking about building very large continental scale transmission systems to blend because the wind's blowing on the East Coast and I've got the sun in the Southwest. Ideally, I can get more of a base load put together. And then you've got storage and other things that are added in that may be in different locations. You have to pay to connect that up. Space-based solar gets us back to being able to build a power system like we've had in the 20th century, which is you have a power plant, you have a customer, and when the customer needs power, the power plant delivers it. And the, the really cool thing is space-based solar is both a generation and a transmission system. So it's able to generate power 24 seven, and then it's able to move power from where it's needed uh, at one point in time to another. So for about the same amount of uh, metal as it takes to move power from an offshore wind uh, farm into a city or to go uh, 200, 200 or so kilometers out of a city, we can build a system that's able to move power from New York to LA as demand shifts. And that gives us a great way to balance and deal with some of the challenges that we have today with intermittent renewables. So Peter, space-based solar power, it's originally an American idea. Why hasn't the United States been at the forefront of this technology's development? I mean, China, Japan, the European Space Agency, the UK, Saudi Arabia, they're all pursuing it. Perhaps I've even left out a country or two, right? So. We know that NASA has said it will work. And uh, just this week, the Special Competitive Studies Project, which has luminaries from Google and from the Department of Defense, this group, they're not slouches, they named space-based solar power as the number one next generation technology. So what's the holdup? So Laura, I mean, the principal problem is uh, a lack of uh, ambition and leadership. So. You know, we easily could have had this technology, you know, well over a decade ago, perhaps even earlier, but, uh, you know, we've, we've never had the leadership where we needed it. We didn't have the leadership at the very top to direct it with policy and strategy. We didn't have the leadership at the top of uh, NASA and DOE to elevate it to the president, vice president. So, you know, there are 
as a result of that lack of leadership and that lack of aggressiveness on the part of our space agency and Department of Energy, we have really let America slide to probably fourth or fifth place in the world, uh, you know, in terms of who's developing that. Probably China number one, uh, ESA and Japan probably very, very close in. And then, uh, you know, you've got uh, some others that are that are helping those out. UK, Saudi Arabia, now South Korea has joined. Um, and so, you know, the United States has uh, has lacked um, anybody in charge. So, you know, without clear direction from Congress or a president saying NASA, DOE, DARPA, ARPA-E, you know, it, it's your job, um, particularly in eras of flat budgets, all it's sort of the natural tendency of bureaucracies to point the finger at the other guy and say, well, you know, that's why we have a Department of Energy or it's a space technology, that's why we have NASA. And as a result, um, nothing gets done. Uh, and, you know, this really falls in the cracks because it is an energy technology, but it is a space technology enabled energy technology. And so it lies at that you know, nexus of something that's extremely strategic. Um, and so it has for decades fallen through the cracks. But doesn't this like fall in line actually with the current administration's policies for, uh, you know, renewable energy? It is an astounding failure to walk the talk of this administration. You know, this administration that is been so powerfully concerned as their number one agenda to go after climate change and new green energy technologies and next generation uh, manufacturing, next generation jobs. I mean, this is everything. I mean, it's all there in space solar power. You know, it is being, you know, uh, it is part of a competitive strategy with China. It is something that our closest allies in Europe and Japan and, and Great Britain are all interested in. And the failure of this administration to realize the opportunity in front of it is truly an astounding failure of leadership. So what I'm going to do now, uh, just before I ask Ed um, and Peter, uh, the final question. I'd like to show everybody the video from Verta Solis, which is absolutely astounding, and it 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 really does uh, a few thousand words worth of explaining things of of how this could happen, of how this could work, right? And let me do that here. Me, here we go. And um, I'm going to play it with the sound off so that I can ask Ed and Peter the next question while everybody watches. All right, this is blast off. In fact, Ed, why don't you why don't you narrate this just a little bit for us? Okay, so the the, the fundamental concept we have is that we are looking at a way of producing solar power in space, beaming it down to the ground. The challenge of doing that is you have to get it into orbit. So taking a look at the changes that have happened in launch costs, they've dropped by orders of magnitude in the past couple of years, primarily due to the efforts of SpaceX. But there's other companies coming online that are looking to keep that competition up to keep driving costs down. The video showing, you know, bringing up a mission full of satellites, plus doing a refueling operation to be able to boost the satellites into a higher orbit. For our system, we're using what's called Molnoya orbit which is a highly eccentric, or, uh, eccentric orbit, which lets us um, hold the satellites high over a spot, beam the power, and then complete the orbit very quickly and putting together a cluster of satellites that will make that happen. You're seeing now the assembly steps. So the idea is that this is going to be building upon the work that's going on right now within space assembly. Uh, we would be bringing up a pallet of satellites and then be using in-space assembly to assemble those satellites into a single working structure. And in fact, the, the system that we are working on is highly distributed so that each satellite itself is an autonomous device, which when it brought together works with the whole to generate a very large collection area for energy and to generate one beam that goes down to the earth. Uh, you're seeing right here um, just a artist rendering of what that assembly might look like. Uh, the pieces are put together. And then as we get to a sufficient size, we're able to turn it on and beam like a laser, the energy to the ground, 
but it's at a very low intensity so that it would be safe for wherever it's brought down to, brought into a secure area, and then distributed out to cities or other dedicated customers. Um, this is a constellation of satellites. So any one satellite has other satellites that it works in concert with. And then this constellation in turn provides 24 seven to the customers that have signed up for it and provides the ability to provide spot power where it's needed. It's an example here of a receiver on the ground. It's approximately two kilometers across. The receiver um, is able to very efficiently convert the incoming RF this case, we're expecting um, the individual rectennas, which are the device that we use, can convert with about 80% efficiency the RF coming in. Uh, it's about twice the efficiency of solar cells. Um, and that's one of the reasons this can actually make sense is because we can very efficiently move the RF energy. Um, brings it to a conclusion here. Uh, our company name is Virtus Solus, and it literally means power of the sun. So. <laughs> it's a great video. Um so there was a recent NASA report, right, that basically said that, hey, this this works, right? This yep. this this will work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they they used years and they used numbers um that were kind of bizarre. So I'd like to just give you the 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 platform here to explain. In, in a perfect world, how much would it cost? How soon could you get a demonstration up? And if everything works kind of fine, because nothing ever works perfectly, right? How soon could we actually have, you know, something that could power, you know, let's say Alexandria, Virginia, which is where I am right now? Oh, okay. So let, let's start with the, you know, what does it take to get there? So as opposed to putting absolute numbers, I'd like to talk more in terms of like other industrial programs. My background is automotive and, you know, automotive programs, putting a new car on the road it is not cheap, but it's something that we do 40, 50 cars a year come out brand new. And the investment to get space-based solar working is, we think, done properly on the order of getting a new car into production. All right. That, that, that should scope it. We don't think this is like the equivalent of things that have been done in the past but simply getting a new car into production is the same scale that we have here. The reason that's believable, if you take a look at things like what SpaceX has made happen with getting Starship online compared to other programs, you take a look at the pace of operations that uh, the new space launch companies have been able to sustain, all of those come together to say these costs are gonna going down and continue to go down. Space-based solar is roughly going to be about a third of the cost of the system you have in orbit, a third of the cost for getting it into orbit, and a third on the ground. But because it's so efficient, it's much smaller and more compact than building an equivalent solar plant. And so it can be cost competitive because it does power 24-7. So our rough numbers are we're about six times better than the best solar plant, and we are about twice the price. Um, for getting something to happen, you know, obviously this comes down to a lot of things that have to come together, but we see a path to get there. So at the very early 2030s, we're looking at real power being brought down to do real things on the ground. Um, now, powering cities may take a little bit longer because we see a path of coming into more remote locations with dedicated customers. Um, and there are a lot of people that are paying through the nose to run industrial operations um, in remote locations, transporting energy in, getting power lines in. These are all incredibly expensive. Being able to transmit the power that we produce to wherever somebody wants to make it makes it a very attractive proposition for these uh, remote users. Additionally, um, there is greening of industry and things like that, where there's a huge premium on being able to get green 24 seven power. So we see it coming in, in this industrial side first, and then later on working it into the utility to, to power the light bulb in your house. But as it scales, the prices will keep coming down. All of the systems we've got eventually should collapse down to the cost of raw materials. It's not like it's really expensive materials and the cost of energy to put it into orbit and manufacture the individual parts. And the cost of actually getting something into orbit when you can get 100, 200 reuses out of a rocket doesn't look much worse than shipping airmail. And we think that's, you know, this is the big piece that's coming. Um, in fact, if you, you look at the things that are being proposed right now by point-to-point like -point rocket transport, the numbers on that actually don't look too bad. So, you know, we're just looking at a different location to put all of it. So it's a logistics problem and a high-volume manufacturing problem. And we think that this is something that the commercial sector can take on and make happen. Would it be fair to say that the nation that 
demonstrates, builds, deploys, actually, you know, has online as a real part of their uh, uh, electricity mix is really a First Nation. I, I, I would think so. I mean, getting this online, it, it's if you want to take a look at like the accomplishments in space, the, the ISS is about 450 tons of material. Getting a small scale solar, uh, space based solar is going to be on the order of one, two, three space stations worth of material. It's in a higher orbit. It takes more energy. But, you know, already right now we're putting up the equivalent of multiple uh, ISSs a year in launch capability. So as we look down a few more roads, uh, a few more years, if these trends keep up, one year of launch launch into orbit will have more than sufficient capability to get a plant, uh, a space-based solar plant into orbit. And, you know, it will not be a strain on it. When this was looked at in the 1980s, the entire plan that they put in place was building the infrastructure. We've had 40 years, 40 plus years since that was looked at. That infrastructure is now in place. The increase in launch pace with the um, different uh, constellations that are going up, all are putting that rate of launch, that capability in place, that actually moving from uh, information to energy with what we primarily do in space looks very tractable. Peter? I want you to answer that too, because we know that China's working on this, right? We know that, you know, also our friends are working on this. You know, what, what does it mean to be the first in this? Well, you know, Laura, the problem that you always have with, you know, the first mover advantage is the ability to rapidly grab market share and then allow the consumer to essentially amortize your your fixed costs and then you can continue to produce things lower and lower over time and we're talking about a technology that is so stunningly powerful you know that it isn't the kind of technology that you would really want an autocratic power to have right you wouldn't really want somebody that has ill will toward you or your allies to you know be able to turn on and off the lights or the power you you would prefer that to be you know within your own or within you know hands that you that are trustworthy and have your best interests at heart and you know this technology you know you know energy is like 12 percent of the global gdp right it's not minor and the number of jobs that something like this you know would have has been you know estimated to be you know like equivalent to the entire fast food industry or the automotive industry so you know you're really talking about you know surrendering you know a tremendously large long-term component of the global economy and jobs and you wouldn't want to you know do like we did with 5g and essentially put your allies in a position where you know the only companies on the table are you know chinese state champion companies that are going to you know, put in espionage gear, you know, you don't want to hand, you know, a, 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 the equivalent of a gas pipeline to Europe, you know, that a, a foreign power can just turn off, nor do you really want to, you know, allow, I mean, let me, let me put this in perspective, right? If Ed there, who showed you his video, gets his way, he will immediately dwarf the, the launch um, launch needs of most other satellite systems, and that means that whoever you know is first to this will essentially control the global launch industry. You know, it it will go to that because of the the tremendous volume of launch that something this large, which is significantly larger than Starlink is today, which is the driver for for launch today. So, you know, if we don't want to see our own industrial base denuded, if we don't want to see our allies having to uh, kowtow, you know, to an autocratic power, um, this is not a technology that you can take lightly, you know, or have a cavalier plan about. It absolutely requires U.S. leadership. And on the other hand, you know, for some of the listeners that may be thinking about, you know, future jobs, you know, this is something that would truly truly take the entire space economy to the next level. The number of jobs that would be required to do this across the, the satellite design, satellite manufacture, satellite operations, launch, uh, the uh, space traffic management, the movement you know, between 
your uh, low Earth orbit and whatever your orbit where you're going to put the satellite is, you know, are are phenomenally large, much much larger, you know, than what we're doing with mega constellations today. So, you know, I think we're going to see an extremely exciting future because, you know, whether or not it's the United States leading or somebody else, somebody is going to do it, right? And the first generation will probably look something very much like what Ed showed. Uh, and over the longer term, we'll probably switch to using um, material from the moon and asteroids uh, because of its, uh, because of the attractiveness of sourcing and launching from space versus uh, sourcing and launching in from the heavy gravity well of Earth. And this is the largest potential, like if you're excited about asteroid mining, if you're excited about lunar mining, this is the largest market for that is to, and, and we have to recognize that that's part of the Chinese moon base plan, right? They, you know, General Zhang Yulin has been very clear that their plan is to industrialize the moon to build solar power satellites at scale. Artemis is not doing that right now. Uh, the NASA report makes it very clear that, you know, uh, NASA, that this is not a use case for NASA at present. And that's going to require um, uh, some serious le national leadership to put us on the right track. So now is the time I want to and actually need to because we're, we're running short on time, but I want to open it up to the floor to the liftoff team to uh, ask you some more questions. So Ubaldo, take it away. Hello, hello. Uh, Peter, it's good to see you again. It's been a minute and Ed, it's a pleasure to, to virtually meet you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, this is an incredibly fascinating um, topic and you know, it's it's one that I think if more and more people knew about, right? Like our voices, you know, we need to combine more voices. I think um, it, it's the space has a communication problem. I think we talk about that all the time, and not enough people know, right? So this is why we're doing this. And so thank you for for your perspectives and thought leadership on this. You know, I guess um, you know I've been trying to think of what question to kind of kick off with, uh, and I'm trying to think of this through the lens of sort of the general populace, right? But, it, and maybe one way or one place to start is going to that point of the power and control and security of, of this. What's to keep um, someone from turning these into lasers, if, if if that's a thing? Is that a thing? Not not really. I mean, I'll jump into it for a second. I mean, if these are built correctly, there's different designs. I'm gonna start with a very simple one that we've got. You're going to have something on the order of like 1300 watts per square meter coming in on one side of a system. Uh, there may be concentrators, there may not be, but antenna physics and things like that, that if we're working with RF, lasers are a different issue, but if we're working with RF, it's very, very tough. In fact, it will take about everything it takes in the first systems just to get the majority of the power onto a target on the ground. So it's very tough for like the tile system we've had for it to ever get any power level that's higher than what comes in on the sun side for the locations we're at. More advanced systems, as, as the generations build out, there may be some ability to get the power levels higher. But everybody that's talking about this right now, there's limitations that are driven by the atmosphere, limitations that are driven by health and human safety standards, that the power levels will probably never go above about a quarter of sunlight. So if you were to stand in the middle of the beam and sit there on a cold night, you would probably actually feel very comfortable. And at times we've had discussions thinking we're going to be doing a lot of effort to prevent birds and other animals from deciding that's the best place to be on a cold December night. Um, so the, yeah. the energy intensity we think in the near term is not going to be any any issue um, okay. as long as it's using RF. Because it just it just has me thinking of like, you know, as a kid, right? The magnifying glass, you know, it's a the, but, that, but if you put that, the magnifying the glass far enough away, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> And, yeah, and, right, right. That's what it is. The The orbits that people are looking at, the orbits are like geosynchronous, Molnoya for us. The orbits are so far away, you can't focus. And, yeah. and that's just the physics of what frequency you're working at, how big your magnifying glass is, et cetera. Mm, um, so that's the bit that keeps us somewhat, that's what bit that keeps us to be a, a safe system that even if, say, you had uh, somebody hijack it, um, you know, it would be very hard for them to cause any kind of damage. Yeah, Peter, what, as far as then um, impact, like on our wallets, I, I'd love to hear from you about, like, like how much would this cost per kilowatt, for example, for the consumer, like, and, and 
Uh, what does that potentially, how does that compare to what we're all paying now? Well, I don't think any of these startups or any of the national plans are, are you know, going to be interested in space solar power if it can't be essentially within the same cost range uh, that, you know, yeah. we're, we're looking at today. And so, you know, I, you know, Ed can talk about his fantastic white paper that I thought was a was a excellent rebuttal to the very pessimistic um, NASA study. But even in the NASA study, you know, they assessed a range uh, and came down to like as low as as three dollars a kilowatt hour um, using you know what I thought were were actually fairly conservative assumptions, especially for as far out as they were looking. You know, they you know they. NASA unfortunately chose to report and highlight their baseline, which was about as about as silly a way to do it as possible. You know, you only build one system, a first of a kind system. You know, you you do it by throwing away uh, starships. Um, you know, requiring you know way more refuelings than you need to. Uh, not using electric propulsion. Uh, having a satellite lifetime that was so short that you had to replace it, you know, three times over in 30 years. But, you know, uh, but when it used what I would say are sane assumptions, which is using electric propulsion to move from from low Earth orbit to the, your higher orbits. And, you know, when it used um, fifth, just just 15 year satellite lifetimes, you know, now we've got something that is not only the lowest carbon intensive energy, meaning that over its lifetime, it uh, produces you know, less carbon than wind, solar or nuclear, um, mm. you know, but is also, you know, three cents a kilowatt hour, which is, you know, astoundingly, you know, good. So there, there's quite a range, you know, space solar power doesn't even have to get close to that today to, to do, um, you know, serve your niche users. But, you know, in the long term, we're talking about something that is directly competitive with any other energy source. Yeah, and, and I just like to add one thing to it. It's not only competitive, but it's it's a fundamentally different one. It's close to having the equivalent of a nuclear power plant or gas powered in that the power is always available. So when we look at like the dropping cost of solar, we look at the dropping cost of wind, even if those become free, the, the additional cost, the overbuild are gonna drive transmission energy storage, et cetera, plus demand management to make energy more expensive. So we see space-based solar solving that. You know, something else that I think is really interesting that the NASA report unfortunately did not cover is many times when you, you know, want to compare energy systems, you want to compare them on several scales, right? So that's actually quite important. You know, the United States, when it submitted its long-term um, energy plan to the United Nations uh, to go after climate change and net zero by 2050, it evaluated on, you know, the basis of like land use on, you know, how it competes with uh, uh, agriculture, what is its water use, you know, what is its carbon displacement. Um, and then other folks who think about energy, particularly in terms of economics, look at what's called energy payback time and energy return on energy invested. And to give you a sense of like how amazing space solar power is, um, you know, for an equivalent amount of energy output, you're talking about something like, you know, five times less land than you would require just for the solar panels, not for the incredible tracts of land that you need to move that power over high power cables, you know, across the country. You know, something else that people, you know, don't think about is that Solar is great if you like living in Arizona, but if you're in Pittsburgh, right, it would be really, really nice to have a solar power satellite that could provide you with 24 hour green green power because the, you know, the sunlight they get up there is a tiny fraction of a, of a state with lots of, of sunlight. And then, you know, uh, when you get to this idea, of, so it's lower in land, no cooling power, um, but obviously, you know, smart people are going to be like, yeah, yeah, but you know, you've You've got to produce all this metal. You've got to produce these, you know, these metal starships. You've got to fuel these starships with hydrocarbons. You're going to be putting out a lot of carbon. But when you actually run the numbers, if if it only operates for 15 years, it displaces. It's like a 300 to one, mm. uh, you know, displacement of carbon. So I mean, it's amazing compared to like the coal that would displace in terms of you know what it would mean. 
And then similarly, you know, there's like energy payback time um, and carbon payback time and energy return on energy investment. So the energy return on energy invested for uh, solar power, especially if you include storage, is very low. It's like single single digits. The best energy return on energy investment we have on planet Earth is hydro is uh, um, our you know hydroelectric dams, which are eighty to one. Space solar power is easily in excess of two hundred to one, right? Easily twice the best of anything on Earth. And then energy payback time for like a solar panel on Earth is something like you know two years but in space you know it's like 30 days it's amazing the amount of sunlight uh, falling on that so you know from an environmental perspective right and then another thing that almost everybody you know who who's clever will say yeah but you know what we're trying to stop global warming and you're putting more energy into the <laughs> earth like how's that going right. to work out right but you know first of all you have to realize that what you care about is the energy that's trapped in the earth system right and so we have this amazing amount of energy coming into the earth and then most of it gets reflected back out well a solar cell even if it were like 50 percent efficient you're changing the albedo right so what that means is that of the incident sunlight that might come in and bounce back to space 50 percent of that gets trapped as waste heat and doesn't make it into the electric grid and so that's putting a lot of waste heat, this heat island effect into the biosphere, right? So a space solar power satellite is way better than that because it's 85% efficient at the rectenna. So, you know, you're, you're, you're rejecting way, way less heat. And this is better than anything else, right? Even if you had fusion today, fusion is just going to boil water. So it's, it's going to need something to cool and, and boil that water, right? Uh, which is its own separate environmental load. But that fusion, you know, that is a Carnot cycle engine. So at most, it's like 33% efficient or so, right? Which means that, you know, three times the amount of power going into the grid is being wasted as, hmm. as um, heat energy, you know, into the thing. And what, and that, by the way, is not terribly significant compared to what they call carbon forcing. And so what you really care about is can you remove the because the carbon keeps that energy in instead of allowing it out right so if you can displace the carbon that's even more important than the amount of heat that you're putting into the the biosphere either way yeah. and this gets back to what i was talking about the carbon return on carbon investment you know when you have such an incredible incredibly low life cycle carbon impact for your energy and when eventually you can use that energy to remove carbon dioxide from the air now you really really got an incredible tech yeah that's incredible well and, and what i where it's leading me to kind of for my final question to you ed is you know th this and, and peter you mentioned you know um in the app like in, in orbit, metal, things like that, kind of the, the things that might be necessary to really truly make this happen. Ed, like what kind of collaboration of organizations, of, of companies, is it going to take to create this sustainable, you know, space power effort and economy, you know, to, to really truly make this happen? Like what, who, it's not all on your shoulders, right? Oh, no, no, no. It, it's like, this is like any other large construction project. There's going to be folks that are taking care of things they're specialists in. So right now we have a collaboration with um, uh, Intersect Power. They're one of the largest solar developers on the ground and a strategic partner with us for handling, you know, what it takes to really build a receiver on the ground, integrate it into the grid, deal with site permitting, and all the other things that you have to do in order to put real power down. We have uh, another uh, partnership with Orbital Composites. Orbital Composites is working on building some of the largest antennas that have ever been built. They've won several recent contracts on that, and we've announced a, part, uh, a project with them to put a demonstration of in-space assembly and so space-based solar power in 2027. Um, there's folks that will be handling logistics in space, folks that will be handling the robotics uh, manufacturing, the tools that you'll need for robotics, obviously launch. So it's an entire ecosystem that's brought together. You know, so the folks that bring space-based solar together with the ecosystem we have today are effectively a prime contractor building a power plant. And this entire feeder system of organizations will help out with it. There's folks that specialize in making space-rated solar cells, space-rated electronics, 
Um, all of those pieces have to come together. You know, and then, you know, the key things, it's just like building a car, building a power plant or anything else. It's like, you're going to have the pieces you own. How do the smarts come together? How do I do the operations? What's the overall intelligence design behind making this the most efficient thing it can be? And, and that's a piece that we think we've got solved. Love it. Well, I listen, I can't thank you, uh, Peter, Ed, and Laura. Uh, thank you so much. Like, this was uh, truly enlightening. I think it's just a perfect, you know, conversation starter to what could really change i mean as you indicated it could change so many things so like we we need to take it out of the hands maybe of other organizations and put it into the hands of people like ed and organizations that that collaboration that you talked about of, of companies who can really truly do something about it so thank you all very much um it's it was great. Thank you very, very much. And now, Meredith, I hand you the baton. We're going to talk about <laughs> um, the eclipse and, and what's going to happen uh, uh, for the eclipse. Like, I think there's some exciting things happening. Well, we know the path of totality is so long and so many places from Texas all the way up into Ohio are going to be able to experience being in the path of totality. Now, if you recall the last one, it was more out to the west or the western part of the United States. I was in Denver, but you drive just a little bit north and get into Wyoming and you were in the path of totality. And for people that have been in the path of totality, it is an experience unlike any other. I don't know if you can see my goosebumps. I always get goosebumps when we're talking about <laughs> things like this and science and astronomy events like this that we get to be part of as a society. There are so many different events going on. I'm actually going to be hosting one in Dallas, which I'll share more information, of course, as we get a little bit closer to that. But we do have a very special guest here to talk about one that'll be happening near Austin, Texas. And it's actually going to be, uh, let's see here, I, it's called the Texas Eclipse Festival. So exciting. And so actually, I'm really excited to introduce to us now Ari Eisenstadt. So just to give you a little bit about background on Ari, he's directing the space program for the Texas Eclipse Festival. He is international futurist at the University of Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies. And he's just got a great background. He's got history in astrobiology, talks about space exploration, human rights, Ari, we're so glad to have you on today because we want to learn a little bit more about this Texas Eclipse Festival, sort of the, the location, because I know it's close to Austin, but I'll tell you one thing. When I was going on the website, I thought camping, you know, there's the Burning Man Festival, there's Coachella. Is this kind of a combination of everything as we celebrate the eclipse? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Meredith and Ubaldo. It's so great to be here with you all. Uh, yeah. really appreciate the work that, that you're doing. And uh, yes, yeah, so I'm really excited to share about the Texas Eclipse Festival. Uh, and it, it's been compared to, to Burning Man, to Coachella, but also a TED conference and a South by Southwest and something really unique celebrating this uh, really special celestial event. Uh, and so it's in Burnett, Texas. Uh, about an hour and 15 minutes outside of Austin uh, at Reveille Peak Ranch, this beautiful, uh, this beautiful and hill country uh, uh, over about 500 acres and then another another thousand acres uh, to to explore. So, uh, yeah, we're we're uh, imagining 40,000 people there uh, wow. and have <laughs> seven stages of music and six stages of speakers across many different topics. And uh, I'm really privileged to be able to lead the space program there. 40,000 really... people? That's I know, we... right? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> wow. That's, I mean, Austin's airport is going to be busy. So I guess to get yeah. your tickets early. And I was looking at the website and the good thing it looks like is you can actually have a couple of days to experience this festival. So it's not like you come in on Monday, you actually have passes for two, three, four day, and it can be as get down in the dirt and let's uh, camp or like me, I would be doing the glamping option. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the glamping glamping is going to be really nice. There are r real beds, canvas tents, but even with the the camping, they'll have electrical outlets. Uh, there'll be a uh, a quarry there to swim in. There'll be a spy. They'll they'll be. It's definitely roughing it, but but there'll be some uh, some really nice upsides to to make the the time uh, really worthwhile. Uh, and yes, it starts officially on April fifth. 
uh, until the, the 9th, but there's also early entry on the 3rd and 4th. If hmm. people wanted to come early, there'll be music and other activations. But um, our space program kicks off on the 5th uh, with a collaboration with Yuri's Night. So so that will be a really oh. exciting celebration that evening. So That's so cool. Let me, can ahead, I ask you how long it's like how long have you guys been planning this because clearly the date has been set for you know you know centuries but how how long have you been planning this so uh the the, the plan's been in, in the works for yes for a long time uh we also have uh many global collaborators that like symbiosis gathering and people that organize the Oregon uh, eclipse festival uh uh, many other other events. So there are lots of different partners that that go into this and uh, put together event planning. Uh, I'm a part of the probably nothing team. So we're we're uh, kind of the management company and leading the visions of the future zone that includes the space, the tech, AI. Uh, there will be a Texas on chain, a uh, Web three uh, zone and activation. Um, and so yeah, that, that's that's been going on for for a while. We really started. Uh, ramping up uh, with the uh, with the space program, though just uh, just in November when when I joined. That's awesome. Now, is this an event that is it more family friendly, or is this something that's for adults? Like, come out with your friends, come out with your coworkers, and experience the eclipse. It will definitely be. It's an all ages event, uh, so there'll there'll definitely be activities for for kids. There'll be a, a kids area. Uh, and then there will also be music going all night. So there'll, there'll be different ways of, uh, of I think, um, kids' child care through, through the evening so that wow, parents, that's uh, nice. parents can get away <laughs> and, and support the, yes, the audience and get some dancing in. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really, really all ages. And from uh, the people that love to go to music festivals, to the Eclipse Chasers, to uh, yeah, people first time experiencing either of those things. So is this something that, would you say it's more about the eclipse? Is it more about a festival in general? And what sets this apart from, say, going to another eclipse festival along the path of totality? Sure. Well, uh, from the space program, I, I think it's it's really special. We're, we're up to, I think, 12 astronauts right now, uh, uh, past and, and upcoming. And what's really unique is that we have astronauts from every flight provider. So we have Nicole Stott and Ron Guerin, former NASA astronauts. Uh, but we also have uh, Cyan Proctor and Chris Zembrowski from the Inspiration4 SpaceX crew. Uh, we have a few people, uh, Yemi um, AD. We have uh, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, uh, and Brendan Hall, who will be on the star in the Starship uh, mission, the Dear Moon Project, uh, with Chris uh, Chris Huey with Virgin Virgin Galactic, uh, Chris Bashausen with a uh, uh, Blue Origin, who's also will also be DJing uh, as Dr. Crispy, um, and then we on the on the other side we have uh, the Space Perspective community that we're really excited to showcase. Uh, so uh, Space Perspective just launched their uh, their new test capsule uh, with the with the stratospheric balloon. Uh, and we're we're collaborating with them on the glasses of imagining humanity in space, imagining this perspective of uh, the overview effect. And so it's not just about the heliophysics of of the eclipse, but it's really putting into uh, this this idea that we're going through this new industrial revolution of outer space. We are we are entering this new space age, uh, and and so we want to really engage with that and imagine our future in in space and as a multi-planetary civilization. So I think that that's pretty unique uh, from other music festivals and from other eclipse science festivals. Well, I know this just sounds like a random question, but I'm sure a lot of people watching this might have it. What do you pack for this? Like, is there going to be food? <laughs> yeah. Do you have to bring a picnic basket? I mean, you know, when Costume. you think camping, there's certain things that you bring for camping. Sure. Yeah, uh, costumes. I uh, you yes. definitely, <laughs> definitely can can be wearing as creative outfits as as you can imagine uh and th there's there's a pretty comprehensive camping packing list uh on on the website c s e e texas eclipse.com um and there i think there are a few dozen uh food options and vendors there so uh you can bring your own food but there'll be uh really outstanding texas uh meal options that i'm really looking forward to so is this something that has been going on in the past and this year's it's specific to the eclipse? 
uh, th there are the 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 disco um, uh, community, the the production company. They produce hundreds of events around around the country. Uh, many of our partners have produced many of these different different festivals and uh, have been doing smaller activations around around the eclipses. Uh, but th this is really uh, the beginning of something new. And so we're we're already planning for Spain in 2026, uh, and then. Uh, Egypt, Luxor. After that, uh, Australia, all, all going into South Africa in 2030. So uh, we're imagining that th this is really the beginning of something special, connecting all these different areas uh, and celebrating around these uh, these really special events. What do you hope people can take from an event like this? Because it sounds like a lot of fun. Obviously, you're camping for a few days. You're having a good time with your friends. But what do you hope people will take from this moving forward and that they'll be able to, I guess, maybe apply their lives when it comes to thinking about space as we come out of the eclipse? Right. Well, I think I think that the, the eclipse itself, uh, you, you mentioned seeing a, a total eclipse is Versus ninety nine versus one hundred percent is the difference between night and day. It's it's really it's really profound and transformational uh, seeing seeing that and experiencing it. Uh, I got to see my first one in twenty seventeen, but in uh, some small town in in Tennessee, uh, and I was just with with one family member, and uh, it was it was amazing, but it was also very personal, and and I really. Uh, I at that moment I after I said oh I, I wish I was in Oregon uh, for for that event so I think um, it, it's about b b building community together and going through this powerful process it's really uh, interesting and, and PBS will be filming a documentary there and talking about uh, the cultural context of, e of eclipses the emotion of wonder uh, but also the societal impact education talking about global connection the science that comes out of it. Um, and and really where the tech, uh, the science, the art, uh, music all all come together. And so I think that it will be. I think it's a tr it's a transformational experience akin to the overview effect. I think it's it's of the closest you could get. I imagine, and, and this is what will be you know le led by our astronaut speakers. But um, short of being able to go into space, uh, having this experience, uh, I think is that opportunity to uh, have that realization that we are all on a planet, that we're all earthlings, uh, and the, that only border that matters, that thin blue line of atmosphere. And that those are the, those three values that Nicole Stott talks about uh, in her book that she realized going to space. And I think that, that those things are accessible um, when, you, when you experience something like a total solar eclipse. Uh, and, and then with that, with these days of of programming, we we hope that there's real tangible education that comes out of it. We have uh, NASA engineers, we have uh, the leader of emerging tech and AI at the United Nations. Uh, we're, we're we have amazing speakers from all different industries, uh, academia, and uh, and we hope to record these. Uh, these talks and then also have interactive sessions and a lot of my work uh, in in political science and future studies is really being able to take those values and turn them into outcome documents into advocacy uh, programs to really inform the future of outer space policy so it's not just a party we hope to really really be able to move forward with that wisdom that we gain throughout this experience man that's just i um because again, I am like stuck on this 40,000 number. Like it's so freaking incredible. Uh, and, you know, it just has me thinking what a great opportunity, like how, so how do we, you know, because oftentimes, right. You know, people go to this amazing event um, and then they leave and it's like back to normal life. But this is so important because, you know, space is something that's going to take all of us uh, on on planet Earth who you know who want to lend their voice to this effort. So I, I don't know, like how how do people keep going even after the event? Right, it's it's April 9th, uh, They're all going home. How do we keep people engaged? How do we how do we give them a platform from which to shout out their excitement and share? their story about what space means to them, about what this eclipse has meant to them. Because again, it's it's like a once in a lifetime for a lot of people. Like that's incredible. 
Right. It, it will be the last one in the in the continental U.S. for for 20 years. Uh, and uh, while we hope that it inspires people to uh, to be able to travel internationally, we know that that's yeah, this is a really special uh, opportunity. Uh, and I think, uh, like I mentioned, with with our, our space policy and advocacy program, that's through uh, the United Nations Association and the Outer Space Innovation and Advocacy Series that that we created. Uh, but we also are working with some amazing nonprofits that will continue this work. Uh, one notable uh, organization is the Sci Art Exchange, and th they've launched uh, a special uh, design your habitat uh, art competition. Uh, and so people can uh, upload their art and their vision for space habitats and we'll showcase that at the festival, but that will be an ongoing campaign uh, that we're excited to, to share. Uh, we're also collaborating with the Earthlight Foundation and their DreamScope program uh, to donate telescopes to schools to instill this inspiration of, of astronomy and the future of humanity in space. Uh, Collaborating, of course, with with Yuri's Night, which really celebrates the first human in space and and uh, and has uh, decentralized events around the world. Um, we're featuring the the Conrad Foundation and the Conrad Challenge, which uh, will have their uh, summit uh, at uh, Space Center Houston a few weeks later, which uh, showcases top uh, tech being developed by mostly high schoolers, so youth. Um, we'll have Space for Humanity and uh, Le Leaders in Space is also a really a really exciting platform that will be uh, that will be really premiered uh, at the festival. And this is being led by uh, Rave Mehta, who um, has chartered several capsules uh, for space perspective, and will be bringing political leaders uh, into uh, into the space perspective uh, capsule and uh, and going up to space and getting that overview effect experience and uh, and hopefully changing the public uh, public outlook and their leadership. Um, and so many other uh, other organizations and nonprofits, but um, yeah, we we really see this as as a gathering for. Uh, these these powerful uh, decision makers in the space community and hoping for that to ripple out to look at the future of sustainable development of the space industry. Uh, and from this, this human rights based approach, we'll have uh, indigenous leaders and leaders in consciousness and, and health. Um, environmental leaders uh, as as well. So um, it, it, I think it's it's a really unique way to connect again that space and tech with with the the art and music, but also uh, the consciousness and the traditional uh, ecological wisdom that sure. that we're. Hmm. That's. I have one more question for you, and this Ooh. is kind of a, a broader question. I know your festival; it sounds incredible. Maybe some people aren't going to get to Austin, but for anyone that's watching across the United States, why should they take part in some sort of either festival or maybe taking their kids for the afternoon or a school doing something when we see the the, the path of totaler in these communities? Why should people care about this event and why should they participate in some way? I know you said it's going to be another, what, 40 years or 20 years? I mean, I know I'll be in my 60s. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think everybody should know that this is something that it's worth taking that time out of the day, even if it's, you know, in the middle of a school day or middle of a work day going outside with your coworkers. Yeah. And I think, I think it, on, on a deeper level, the, the question that, that we all get in the space community is why is space important in the first place? Well, why do you all care about space? And I think that for, for me, my, my answer has been that we are in this space age that our communication technology, our computing, our energy, our manufacturing, our water, food, waste, uh, all of these technologies are, are space technologies and that we are in space, we are of space. Uh, and uh, it's it's critical to imagine our future in space to solve these global challenges that we're going through. Uh, and I think that a total solar eclipse is a special way of of connecting with that. And uh, in 19, um, I believe it was 1919 that uh, we had the total solar eclipse that proved Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. And this, of course, was the first uh, the first time that they were able to uh, accurately measure the distance and what because the only time you could see stars during the day is during a total solar eclipse. So the stars come out, there's this ring of, of sunset around the horizon. And they were able to show that gravitational lensing changed the position of those stars versus in the night sky. And that really 
created a new paradigm, a new scientific age from those that Newtonian physics to uh, to special relativity. And I think now, uh, looking forward, we have the opportunity to not just in the again the the, the heliophysics of understanding the mystery of coronas and the sun, but but really again thinking about our place in the universe and what it means to uh, become multiplanetary. I have chills. I don't know about you, Abaldo. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I it's again. It's it's. There's so many, uh, you know, so many amazing things happening right in our universe uh, on the planet that can be sort of th this catalyst for bringing our community together uh in many communities right from all walks of life from be you know there, there's going to be so many different kinds of people there like it's just such an incredible opportunity and you know it's it's i think space has the power to really change our perspective on a lot of things, right? Like how how often do we all get so kind of like narrow focused in on, you know, things that ultimately, like if we just had a conversation with somebody, those things would go away. <laughs> uh, and and this is an opportunity to, again, spark that movement. And so it's just so fascinating. And Ari, I can't, you know, can't thank you enough for um, leading the effort on one of these festivals. And I, man, I hope, I hope it's, you know, we can do these annually because I can't be there this year. Like, <laughs> uh, it's sad because I'm going to be in, I mean, it's not sad. I mean, I'll be in Hawaii. I shouldn't complain, but. Oh, um, okay. I know. Hawaii. I mean. I'm <laughs> we'll doing, be in I'm, Texas and you'll be in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing a triathlon. It's not like, you know, but it, it's partly, <laughs> it's mostly for fun. But anyway, the point is <laughs> that I, you know, I think the, these kind of festivals, um, for those who don't see Burning Man, for example, as accessible to them, I, I think there's op options like this that that can be accessible to everyone. And uh, I hope I hope you all um, keep doing them. <laughs> I agree, Ari. This is fantastic, and I have to say because so many people have families and they wonder, well, what can I do where the kids can get educated, but I can still be an adult. And it sounds like, you know, having that 24 hour childcare, having that opportunity where they could still experience it as a family, but then it's a vacation for the parents as well as that it's for the family. It's also, I think that's important. And there should be more festivals like that because I mean, I don't have kids, but I can imagine, and I know my friends that have kids, there are those things where you want to do something, but you're also like, I want to be an adult, but I want my kids to have fun too, you know? Exactly. We we really want to make it available to everyone, and and we're so grateful to these uh, educational organizations that that are participating. Uh, I mentioned a few, but we also have uh, Nicole Stott is bringing her uh, her art spacesuit to the Space for Art Foundation of uh, that were designed by uh, pediatric cancer patients and have mm. gone up to the ISS, and uh, we have space for. Uh, a better world, um, the We Are Stars project. I mean, there there, there are just so many uh, initiatives that that I think are are so wonderful to support and get involved with. And again, this is mostly just on the space side that I'm speaking. Uh, and the and the other the other topics also have their uh, wonderful transformational and immersive experiences that uh, that I'm so excited for for people to get to see. Yeah. Love it. Well, Ari, thank, thank you. you again. Thank you for taking the time today. I mean, it's um, this is uh, an episode that uh, will air right around uh, the time of the eclipse. So um, you'll be in full swing down in uh, down in Texas. So good luck with everything. Have a blast. Thank you for thank you for paving the way. Um, yeah, just can't wait to keep going. Really appreciate it. And sorry, I'll miss you in Hawaii, but uh, but yes, I invite you all out uh, to yeah. the University of Hawaii and and be able to share the the exciting work that's being done uh, here across the our future studies program, our Human Rights and Peace Institute, uh, to yeah. the NASA Astrobiology Institute, and the Space uh, Engineering Program. So it's a uh, it, it's really special to be able to. Uh, to be here in in Hawaii and studying and taking some of these lessons and and going around the world and applying that and uh, I think th this eclipse festival is the is the perfect case study of that. Oh, amazing.
Amazing. Yeah, we'll do a whole other episode on just all that. <laughs> we'll do we'll go on site, Meredith. On site, awesome. exactly. Hey, that sounds good. All right, just call us. We'll come out to Hawaii anytime. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, thanks, Ari. Thanks, thanks Ari. So Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> now that makes me think of warmer weather, which I guess in March for most of the United States, Ubalo, it's a it's a good thing. But so many great speakers um this week or this month actually. And uh, I think it just I think it challenges all of us in the coming weeks as we approach the eclipse that, hey, you know, like we're excited. We're we're trying to think of different ways. I mean, Ari's Festival, one example there. I mean, no matter where you're at in the United States, you know, especially the eastern half of the country, there are options to in to experience this. And even if you're not in the the full path of totality. I have to say, it's still cool to step outside and have the glasses or give the kids glasses and just kind of see that little dark sliver, you know, on the moon. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's it's my my hope is that, the, you know, media and the news cycle, you know, doesn't doesn't focus in on, you know, things like certain people who didn't you know, who looks straight at it without their glasses, right? Like, <laughs> let's, let's focus on the science. Let's focus on the space. Let's focus on the community aspect of this, right? Because it's, right. It, it, to your point, like it's giving families an opportunity to do something different that they could may never be able to do with their kids again, right? Like right. that's, this is a once in a lifetime. And, and it's, I think it's just such a cool thing um, that it's, you know, I, I mean, literally, I find myself a few minutes every day considering switching my plans <laughs> to go to on Texas right. for this, but it, so it's, I don't know. I, I think it's a great opportunity and I really hope that it's, um, you know, just, just pushes the the conversation in the right direction. I'd agree. And, you know, I'm, as I was mentioning, I'm going to be doing the event in Dallas. It's actually going to be at the yes. Cotton Bowl for NOAA and NASA and the National Science Foundation. And I, we're working really hard on putting together a great event. I'm gonna be the MC there. But I think as a journalist myself, I look forward to the media day before that to have these conversations with reporters and especially in the in Texas and say, hey, like you guys have done all these stories leading up to it. So let's think of some creative ways to tell stories. And I think for everyone watching, you know, pitch these ideas to your local media. We've talked about this on shows in the past where for local media, we don't know these stories until you tell us. So in these cities in the path of totality, if you have an idea, call your local media and say, hey, you guys have done some stories, but here's a different way to tell the story. Here's an expert you can talk to. I mean, for you, Ari, I would make calls to your Austin market and say, hey, like I was on this show, here's a great idea. Because a lot of times local media, we are hungry to get these ideas and hungry for these stories, but it's always too late until afterwards that people come out and say, well, you should have said this or you should have said that. And most of the time journalists look for those emails, those unique ways to talk. So um, as somebody who's been in television for 16 years now, you know, I think we need to start getting these story ideas out there more and pitch these different angles or talk to the newspapers even and say, hey, Especially when you come to somebody and say, I've already got the people to interview. I've got the B-roll for you to use. I can tell you as a journalist, that's an easy turn story can air later that night. And for a news director, their boss, sometimes they'll see that and say, oh, it's a slow news day. And they'll approve to go ahead. So uh, just just, uh, just pitch the idea. Let's, the more we talk, the more we have these conversations, like why we have this show, the more we're going to get space talked about. I always use this example Space is what climate change was 10 years ago. When I was fresh into the news business, climate change was a, uh, do we talk about it? Do we not talk about it? Look where climate change is now. And I truly believe that's where space is now. We're kind of on that teeter-totter, but in 10 years when we're sending missions and people are taking trips up there, it's going to be front row and center like climate change is. So as a community, especially with the media, let's work together and let's get these stories told. Oh, I love that. I love that. I Can you imagine every local station in the path of totality doing a story of like a just, a, you know, a community based story? Yes. Like that's, thought, that's powerful. It is. And think about like NBC, NBC, all their affiliates. They do a live yes. stream on the channel and then go from from Dallas to Austin, you know, and then you, 
and they break in. Like, I think I would watch my local favorite yes. network because I would want to see something like that. Yeah. All right. We're going to make that happen somehow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Awesome. Yes. And and uh, your event sounds um, amazing. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've, I FOMO hearing about it. And uh, yeah, there, <laughs> there, there are some really special ev uh, events that are all going on uh, at that time. And th that's why we wanted to have this early access period. So you're, you're sure. still invited to come before we have uh, like the Cosmic Perspective, uh, Tim Dodd, Everyday Ask Not, and Mary, Mary Liz Bender, who will also be doing talks and her Anu um, Symphony Experience, and then going to uh, the Planetary Societies event. Uh, Loretta Hidalgo Whitesides has her uh, um, hmm. Eclipse event in Kerrville and that they'll part be participating in at the beginning. So uh, yeah, th there's there's so much going on uh, in Texas and in the region, and uh, yeah, we we wanted to be able to to have something earlier before before that uh, eighth program. But uh, I think again, yes, if if people aren't able to physically travel, there's so many uh, of these media outlets. Uh, we have one of the science communicators from the Griffith Observatory that will be doing live streams across uh, space.com. There there there's some really a uh, really great uh, journalistic opportunities, um, but yeah, I, th I think what what you all are saying that we, we need really the the whole world to be be looking at this. Absolutely, what a great episode! I hope everybody oh, yeah. is just as excited about the eclipse, whether it's seeing it, whether it's the science and technology behind it, as we had our previous speakers on, or you know, just just another chapter we're exploring as a space community of getting public and and everyone excited about what's to come in the space uh, world. Yeah, it was a very sunny episode. See what I did there? <laughs> Duh. And all this meteorologist over here is excited about sunshine. It's cold <laughs> in Cleveland today. <laughs> yeah, right. Wouldn't it be nice to have like a the, that space solar power beam that you could just like step into for a few minutes just to like <sighs> warm up? Like, yes. that, I mean, just I mean, yeah, what an incredible episode. I hope people walk away with, um, kind of a new appreciation for the sun and, you know, a new appreciation for what's happening in, in the space industry. For sure. And, you know, if you have a question, you can always comment on our, on our stream afterwards. If we don't get back to you during this, we always love to continue these conversations afterwards. You can find all of us on LinkedIn, connect, go to social media, connect, because if we're not having the conversations, which is the purpose of this podcast we're doing, we're not moving life forward. So we're glad everybody could join us today. Yes. Thank you all so much. Thank you to all of our guests. Thank you to Laura Winter, our new uh, deep dive uh, journalist hosting, uh, you know, a segment where, yeah, because we want to, we want to dive into a lot of these topics and, and really get a better understanding of, of, you know, how, how these things are impacting policy, government, you know, laws, global international relations all that sort of thing so uh thank you to everybody we really really appreciate it and we will see you Cut. next time <laughs> bye bye Blue.